hello everyone and welcome. Um, we'll probably still have a few more people joining us, but we will get things started. Hi, I'm Holly. Um, I have probably emailed with several of you. Um, I am the director of grants and outreach for the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council. What are we? We are a council that provides grants for meaningful art activities throughout the Arrowhead region, seven counties, it's enormous. Um, the seven counties, let's see if we can name them all. Aiken, Cook, Lake, um, Kuchiching, St. Louis, of course. Um, did Carl I say Cook? <laughs> Carlton, I don't like Cook, Carlton. Those are it, those are the seven. <laughs> Um, and they're fantastic, and we live in the most beautiful part of the state. I don't care what anyone says. Um, and what do we do? We promote listening, watching only. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, what is our mission? The Arrowhead Regional Arts Council's mission is to facilitate and encourage local arts development. The st statement grows from a conviction that the arts improve the quality of life in our region. And our state, and most states don't do this, we are very lucky and it's wonderful. So Mary and I are here tonight to talk about basic grant writing. Um, we're here to field your questions. Um, like I said, who I am, I've been in Duluth over 30 years. I um, My background, I don't remember a time I wasn't drawing or painting or playing piano or anything like that. Um, so uh, I was a graphic designer. I owned a print shop in town, got very involved in community and got back to arts, um, was partner in the North Shore back in the 90s when Homegrown first happened and all that good stuff. So that's my background. That's what, what I'm why I'm here. Miri, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Mary Villiard. If you see my name spelled, it's spelled M-O-I-R-A like Moira, but it's pronounced Mary. Um, I'm a visual artist. My background is in painting. I've done a couple different large-scale community-engaged art projects, including the Chief Buffalo murals down by the Lake Walk and um, just a couple other murals. And then I also am, uh, I guess, a traditional frame-by-frame frame animator these days, so doing large-scale projections. I've got kind of a little bit of background in most visual art forms, and I am the grant writing specialist here at ARAC. Started with ARAC as my first board when I was 18 years old because we have a student liaison position um, for folks who want to serve on grants, and then kind of learned everything I know about grant writing from that and the experiences that sort of followed. Um, yeah, served on the board for five years, I think, and then left so I could focus just being a visual artist, focus on being a visual artist and actually applying for the funding. And now I'm back. <laughs> As a and and how, many, <laughs> how many other boards do you sit on, Mary? <laughs> yeah, I sit on a lot of boards. So um, a very busy artist. <laughs> yeah, Keep artist and grant writer. So I yeah. really enjoy helping people. Kind of my role in, in ARAC is a assisting people as a mini Holly and doing a lot of outreach and meeting with folks to go over their grant applications. Cool part of my job as of right now is that I've been able to help people with like not just ARAC grants, but the state arts board grants too, because we sometimes are very competitive. And so like sometimes you have a great application and there's other opportunities. So I, I really like to help people modify their ARAC grants to submit other places. So fun facts. We are grant geeks and we're here to help. So I guess I'll just share screen and yeah. dive into some kind of grant writing 101. And then maybe towards the end, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of the programs that we've got going right now. I think mm -hmm. on August 2nd, um, around this time, we're also going to be doing a, a workshop specifically focused on the upcoming opportunities we have because um, we have a bunch of deadlines in August. So. Let's see. Um, Canva. Let's see. I'm assuming everyone can see this. So. <laughs> um, yeah, our not our, always the case. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad thing to assume, but I. Uh, yeah. So from an artist's perspective, like I said, um, 
this will be coming more from the perspective of writing for arts grants, but I think the knowledge here that we're sharing kind of applies to all sorts of grant writing. Um, kind of an overview of like, what is a grant? It's free money. Uh, and uh, another thing to, to know about grants is that uh, the panels that decide on the money that goes out to the community are made up of real humans, um, which I think is something that people, you know, I like to break things down in a very simple way because uh, I think uh, at least in my early days of applying for grants, I kind of forgot that part of it. Um, and once you kind of as I go through here, once you realize like the, the human side of this process, um, it becomes a little bit easier to not get your feelings hurt <laughs> when you don't get a, an application. Um, but to also just understand, uh, yeah, just this whole process as a whole. Um, very human. And I'll jump in there too with that is that a lot of people think that our council decides because in the, in the way back machine, the board did do all the decisions. And this was in the, the back in the days of paper grants. So they were like this big, like a stack of paper to fill out. Um, so now what it is, is it's made up of, um, people from our region. And I put out calls for reviewers. It's a good way to learn too. And so I look at what is there and I try to get different reviewers that can speak to it so they can help the other reviewers understand. Because somebody who writes poetry may not understand what it takes to put on a dance production. Someone who paints may not understand what it takes to produce a record. So I get this balance of people so that they can share between. We, as a council, we are here to help. I run each panel, but I am no part of the deciding. So when Mary and I are helping you, we've sat in so very many panels. We've read so many grants. So we're giving you our best advice, but it is still not a guarantee that you'll get it. But this is what we're saying. We're kind of, we're, we can kind of anticipate the holes that those reviewers will try to poke in your grant and things like that. So just so you know what, how our panels are and who the humans are behind them. And also I make everyone be nice all the time. <laughs> okay. And I think too, like, <laughs> I have, I will share a lot of my personal experiences too, because I, I feel like, you know, organizations are also imperfect. And, you know, in some instances, like, some funders, regardless of if it's arts or other spaces, sometimes they're not as, like the staff aren't as hands-on or as willing to hold people's hands um, through the process. I think we're a little bit more on the hand-holding side of things of like making sure that you hit the button. <laughs> you know, I check in on people a lot um, through the through process, but you know, I've, I've applied to opportunities where, you know, I've asked questions and they've been like, well, if I give you the answer, then that might be like a disadvantage to other people. So I can't tell you how things work. So not all organizations work the same way, but our goal is really to make sure everybody is successful for what they apply for. Um, and everybody makes like writes a good grant. Cause again, if you have a really good base grant that you write, you can submit that to other places, even if you're not funded through us. Um, my whole Miri's theory uh, is excitement and thoroughness equals success. So thinking about like um, that human side. So like you're in a grant, you're trying to appeal to like people's emotions and also like make them excited about what you're passionate for. Um, and then thoroughness is basically like answering all the questions. So you wanna make sure you're excited and you answer everything. And so uh, I think some people lean more towards, you know, the the excitement part where they can talk at length about their their project, but then they forget to give you dates or budgets or like the number side of things. And other people sometimes just submit like a, a list of like, here's my expenses and here's my, you know, the technical dates and stuff like that. But they forget to tell the story of like, why are you making the art or the, the project that you've got going? So if you can find the middle ground on that, um, or find people who, I mean, obviously Holly and I are, are pretty good at helping people move across those different sort of waves of um, ability in grant writing. But I think when you're thinking about getting feedback from friends or people in the community too, um, if you're more on the excitement side, find one of those people who like are very serious and, you know, <laughs> um, more type A. Yeah. <laughs> find a critical person to to kind of like bring you down a little bit so you can at least get a little feedback and again, vice versa. Um, 
And I think my biggest tip to everybody in the grant writing world is imagine that you're gonna tie with another applicant. Um, what are the small deals details that you left out of your proposal and what gives you the edge? Because again, in this human process, like sometimes scores result in ties and then that results in you know more conversation about your, your work. Um, and so when you have that thoroughness piece, again, like the thoroughness and the excitement, right? Those are the things that kind of end up breaking ties. Like, are you missing a piece of information? Um, that could be the thing that makes it so you don't get the grant in a tie situation. Um, or it could be a thing where someone just sounds like they love this, like this project is their life and they've articulated that really well with their words. And sometimes that's the edge that a, a grant application might have. Um, and I'll get into like criteria in a second, because that's like obviously the main part about grants. But again, the thread throughout I like people to think about is like, just imagine you're going to tie. Um, I would say, don't feel bad for asking. <laughs> Uh, if you think of like the sources of where grants come from, um, specifically, and Holly can speak to where our funding comes from as far as like the legacy amendment and the state of Minnesota and taxpayers and that that rare yeah. space, but the rare if only space, and she covered it right there. So <laughs> yeah, it's a it's not a common um, experience, or and it's not a common source of um, funding for the arts. I feel like in the United States, most of the um, if you're applying for arts, especially like most of the organizations you'll be applying to are like, um, you know, grants that come from the tax write-offs of corporations. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so it's like somebody generally had a lot of money, started a company like, a, you know, oil company or, you know, sometimes more ethical <laughs> spaces. Um, and basically they have money they need to get rid of for those tax write-offs. And so they need to get rid of that money in order for them to like make more money or be, you know, you know, whatever goals that they have. And so never feel bad for asking for the full amount for things. Uh, if you can make a budget of full of line items that fulfill that entire criteria, um, I would say just go for it. Um, usually there's not conversations at panels in good panels, there's not conversations where people will bring up like, oh, this person has asked for too much money. Um, but sometimes there are conversations where people will score you lower if you didn't ask for enough money, because sometimes that's a feasibility issue, right? Like you, you know, if you felt bad for asking and you decided, oh, maybe I'll pay this artist that I'm working with a thousand dollars instead of like the full 5,000, because I just don't want to ask for more money. Um, that can be of detriment where the, the panelists might ask, well, why don't they want to pay this person like the full wage for the, the project? Like, why aren't they valuing their, you know, the services that they're receiving or, you know, the supplies that they're purchasing, things like that. Um, and I think maybe that's a good time too to bring up the fact that um, what you do is valuable and what your artists that you collaborate with are also valuable. And so by calculating you're calculating your worth or their worth you're showing them what you're worth so even if you have a project and you're going to donate your own time you're going to pay you're going to do whatever but you're going to donate your time still calculate the time it takes you and you can share that as an in kind but you're still always showing the reviewer i know my worth i you know i'm requesting this much for my pay we have a a just a, a number, a random number of $24 an hour is kind of just like a, you know, fair wage or whatever. If you command more than that, then put more than that. If somebody else you're working with commands more than that, absolutely. If that's what they ask, they went to school, you know, I mean, these are the things now, a lot of people went to school for this, you know, have done this, regardless of anything, everyone has practiced their art tremendously. So no one wakes up and then it's just doling out talents left and right. Those are all built. So always pay yourself, always pay your collaborators. I think we have a workshop that's recorded on our website for kind of if you have questions around pricing. I think, yes. was that the one that we invited? Um, you and Darren, yeah. Yeah, so we did it kind of from like, we brought in a musician to kind of talk about his perspectives on pricing. And then I kind of went over like the broad visual arts um realm and uh, a takeaway from that one is thinking about like you're kind of 
it, it, it's not always true, but sometimes you're like as valuable as the last thing that you sold. So if you keep selling stuff for $5, then, you know, that's kind of what your stuff is worth because you set that price. But if you sell something for, you know, a lot of painters, especially they'll price something at a thousand dollars. And then suddenly from that point forward, like everything is bumped up to that value point, I guess. Um, so as far as like what grants can fund, I kind of break them up between the two areas of like project and non-project. So under projects, you have exhibits, films, albums, books, um, any art or yeah, any art or medium that has an output, like a physical thing that you're going to create. Um, and then in addition to that, supplies needed uh, to create the final output. Um, events uh, oftentimes are considered projects in and of themselves, um, classes, research, or apprenticeships, and travel costs occasionally for those um, instances. Um, fellowships are kind of under both realms because um, there's certain, yeah, we'll let people in. There's certain um, instances where like fellowships sometimes require you to like complete a project um but then there's other ones where they just want to pay you for being an artist and they don't really ask you to create anything at the end um projects are basically defined as anything with a beginning and an end like it's a, it can be you know put into a narrative that has a beginning and an end it has a time frame that it's going to be completed in even if it's just like a phase of a bigger project like that could be considered a project in and of itself um and then for non-projects, uh, equipment and supplies that are just for general use. So like um, back when we had the technology and equipment grant here at ARAC, I think I got like an, I'd applied as an artist and I'd gotten an iPad and that was kind of for, not necessarily for um, a specific project, but it was like just to have the iPod, iPad for all future projects, all future mural renderings. Um, Emergencies uh, fall into the non-project category. So your computer explodes or your roof caves in. Um, sometimes there's opportunities to um, get funding for emergencies. Um, um, and, I, and I'll jump in real quick. Old equipment failure is not an emergency. Mm. Old computer failure is not an emergency. If it's suddenly is broken, stolen, stops working for whatever reason. But otherwise, um, it would simply be a uh, get people new laptops. <laughs> so it's it's not that. If if you you know when you buy a computer that you're going to have to buy another one in this day and age, just out of you know how how quickly things become um, antiquated. Yeah. So, anyway, so it's emergencies like, like, you know, oh my gosh. Um, I, well, here's a, for instance, um, a woman, a photographer, and she was going to shoot the show and one of her lenses fell out of the car, was run over by a car. And it was a lens that was very key to her work. So she had an emergency because she has jobs booked and she didn't have that lens. So that's a, for instance, for what our, our, ARAC's emergencies are for. Okay. Yeah. I think they fall into like things that aren't predictable, right? Like you can kind of tell like right. maybe after 15 years, like you're kind of taking a risk <laughs> with keeping your entire life's work on a 15 year old computer versus <laughs> like someone literally took your, you know, one year old computer out of a hot car to save it or something. I don't know. And like, uh, <laughs> you know, took it. So, um, so some, Funders, um, you can make the case for like paying your rent. I think like with our narratives for grants, it's kind of like if you have to pay yourself for creating a project, that's kind of better and a better selling point than saying like, I'm going to use this money to pay rent. Because if you're just paying yourself, then we don't ask you what you like do with that money. You can pay rent with money you pay yourself. Right. So um, buy what you want, buy that equipment you need. Yeah. Yeah, replace that 15 year old computer, but you know, you don't need to tell us that you're buying the computer. So I think that's been a shift for a lot of, um, a lot of funders in general of just like making sure that people just pay themselves. So there's less tracking overall that has to be done on um, everybody's end. Mm -hmm. uh, Plus no more starving artists. We're done mm -hmm. with that. 
I always tell everyone, if anyone wants to take advantage of you, you just call them and I will give them the no more starving artist speech. <laughs> yes. So another service we provide. Um, <laughs> just another one. So uh, the project. So if you're applying for a grant to do a project, generally, again, for both us and other funders, um, there's usually a criteria. Um, specifically with our grants, you'll generally see language around merit, feasibility, impact, and quality. Um, with quality generally being kind of like the main focus uh, or a, a good portion of what we evaluate on or what our community panels evaluate on. And that's kind of just like the general like first impressions of your work or maybe like the, it's a combination of things like first impressions of the work, like the level of skill you're demonstrating in it, um, your resume speaks to quality, quality um, and just kind of how things match up in your application um, with, Feasibility, it's more that we kind of talked about that a little bit earlier um, with, you know, it, does your budget make sense? Um, does your timeline make sense? Like if your project is mega like huge, like some I, I've experienced this in the past and been rejected for grants where my project was way too big. Um, it's not a bad thing to shrink it down and to apply to more grants for the larger vision of, a, of something. We will oftentimes, if you have a very, very large project, we recommend that you break it into phases. So phase one is, you know, the preparation, the research, you know, like that. If we take that, and I always like to say, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So you have a giant project, you need to get down that to digestible. So you can be, you can, you can write your, your narrative and be like, this is phase one of a three phase project and break it up that way because, and I'll tell you why you, you don't want to just do one big thing. Let's say you have a giant grant that could be broken into different phases. Um, if you get the grant for your overall giant grant, you can't come back and get any more grants for that. So you could say, but now I want to pay these other artists. Well, you said this is your whole grant and you've you you don't you want to leave yourself open to be able to get more grants. Yeah, yeah that is. If like, you're having trouble breaking that down, too, Mary and I both enjoy helping you work things into phases. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the biggest lessons I've had in my art career is like again learning how to break things into little pieces so I can take advantage of multiple areas of funding rather than saying this is it, this is the whole project, and then not having enough money to actually do everything that I want to do with it. Um, I give the example of, I had a show called Rights of the Child, where I was going to look at the seven UN uh, human rights treaties that the United States hasn't ratified, and that was going to be my theme. And I was going to do a bunch of artwork and posters based on like all of those different treaties that have a bunch of different histories. And um, you know, years that they were implemented and people involved in making them happen and reasons that they're not ratified. And I spoke to my um, human rights law professor from college and he was just like, focus on one. Maybe you wanna focus on one of those treaties, make your whole show, like do a really good job, like dissecting this whole issue of like human rights, but through one lens. And then if you wanted to apply for more funding to do the other lenses, by all means do that, but it just makes more sense to like, you know, use $10,000 for the the one treaty rather than trying to cram a bunch of different research and, and projects into um, a loosely conjoined project. So I actually, I'd gotten funding on that um, from the State Arts Board. And I think I did have the narrative of seven, <laughs> but uh, a thing that sometimes you're able to do is like when you do a final report, you can submit like how did the the project change and like ultimately with that one, the spirit of the project was still the same and I have not pursued funding for the remainder of the treaties because just that one um, treaty was enough <laughs> to, to do what I wanted. Um, let's see, and impact. Impact is a my favorite one. I think it's, you know, how is it going to impact you? And a lot of the time we look at that in the lens of um, where you're at in your career. So a lot of the time, like, especially for us, like we get people who are established and emerging who are applying to the same pool of funds. Um, 
and both can have like the merit and impact, right? Like of, you know, um, I don't know, a $3,000 grant for an emerging artist who's creating their first cohesive body of work is like very, very impactful. Like that makes sense. Um, the It just might be at a different tier than someone who's more established, but I can't think of an established artist example. Like maybe, I don't know, you get this mega like residency in France or something and <laughs> that you're trying to get funded for that or whatever. Like those seem like they're, you know, at, at these different tiers, but um, both of them have like this huge impact for the artists where they're at. So we try and make sure that you're um, choosing activities or projects that make sense for where where you're currently at. Um, and tips and tricks, my little ways of like, my cheat codes of applying for grants are, you know, we always have these characters, whoops, knock my microphone over. We always have character counts for most grants that you apply for. Um, again, a benefit of reducing your thing down into phases is because you can do like one paragraph on what the overarching project is and then like a paragraph on like the details of what you're trying to accomplish for this one grant that you're applying for. Um, but then you have these spaces in like the budget that I find like sometimes you can give more detailed descriptions of like if you're buying supplies. So um, for that rights of the child grant, I'd written uh, into it a request for supplies for um, a specific type of paint that is like slower drying than other paints. And I wrote a description of that paint in the budget rather than putting it inside the narrative because sometimes the narrative like you just want to you want to focus on the main ideas and if you can get details in other areas without you know um impacting your word count i find that helpful um you want to make sure like again this the human side of this process is like sometimes panelists are less likely to look in those areas for those descriptions so um it is sometimes a risk Again, I have bias. Yes, panels are humans. Um, I encourage people to think of like the biases that might occur in a panel. Um, if you, like for me, I, I feel like I've applied for a lot of grants and kind of predicted, especially if you apply for grants like down in the Twin Cities, that sometimes they don't, you, you look at the track record of people who get funded in greater Minnesota and you see that a lot less people get funded up here and that's a bias, right? And so, um, predicting that or seeing that pattern from different funders, you can kind of address the things that you might see are are problematic in potential panel viewpoints. And so in a lot of my grants that I've gotten from um, foundations down in the cities, I'll just make sure to articulate like what the experience of being a greater Minnesota artist has done to like impact my career. So they get a better sense of, you know, oh, I get it. Like, this is why she only has, I don't know, this is why she's only done one mural because she had to invent an entire process to, you know, approve murals in her town. You know, <laughs> um, do you speak? Do you speak from experience? <laughs> it's it's a it's a thing. So especially when you're coming from smaller towns, like sometimes the systems just aren't in place for you to be successful yet. And so you use your projects to make success for not just yourself but other people. And so being able to articulate that to wealthier or Metro centered um, panelists is a plus. Fortunately, you don't have to deal with Metro artists so much, you know, on our, our panels, because we're just the Arrowhead region up here. Um, we do try and reach out a lot more into the greater Minnesota uh, region that we're a part of and, and get people from um, those areas on our panel and are definitely always trying to track and, and find ways to, to, to do better on that. But I think all foundations are Hopefully they're good, like trying to do that. Let's try. <laughs> um, and then for your work sample, sometimes, you know, I a lot of people get criticized on their work sample for not submitting things that make sense to their project. So if you happen to be a sculptor and a painter and you're applying for funding to do an exhibition of paintings and you only submit pictures of your sculptural work, it ends up giving you like a really low score because the panel can't use that information like they can't tell that you know how to paint based on if you're good at sculpting um they can't tell if you're a good musician if you l submit a bunch of poems you know or just just the lyrics, lyrics. Of your songs <laughs> 
So um, making sure that your work sample reflects what you're trying to do and mm -hmm. advanced level, you know, uh, uh, so for the, again, with the rights of the child show, I was like, this is my first cohesive body of work that I'm going to be combining two styles that I was known for. So I used to do portraiture and then I used to do surrealism separately as separate styles. And um, I wanted to combine them into one. And so I had one painting that demonstrated that I know how to do this. And this was the artistic voice that I wanted to pursue. Um, and so I included that. And when it gave me like, give us a description of this work, I told them like, this is what I like and don't like about this piece. And this is why this grant is important because I want to explore this specific style. And as you can see, my work sample only has these two sort of separate um, styles or whatever. Uh, so, or sometimes people will be like, I want to use this grant period to learn how to paint shadows better. And you look at their paintings and there's not a single shadow anywhere. And it makes sense because like a person reviewing it is like, oh yeah, no, there's there's no shadows in that artwork. They definitely could use this grant to do this better. Um, so there's like ways to be vulnerable in that way that can sometimes um, play for a, I guess, a unique uh, narrative. Well, you know what, and that what you just said something there that reminded me too, is that a project can be you wanting to take a class, you wanting to go somewhere else. Um, you know, a project does not just have to produce a product or a show or a something at the end. It can be, I have gone as far as I can in my particular discipline, and I'm really interested in in. Uh, taking a course at the whatever folk school or online, even different places. I want to expand. I want to try some new things. I'm going to push the envelope and reviewers tend to uh, <clears throat> lean, lean more on somebody because it, because of the impact piece of it too. But if somebody's trying something new, I, if you're tied with somebody else and this person over here is just going to continue to do more of the same that they do. Or it's you who is like, I have kind of saturated what I can do and I need to go more. You're going to be more in favor. It's the pushing the boundaries, the impact, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I think, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Well, It'll come back. Yeah. I'll come back to it. Um, well, I, like pushing the boundaries doesn't even have to be like this big, heavy, like I'm going to become a an impressionist painter now or I'm going to switch from rock music to folk music because that's what's cool right now uh like it's more of like what's a thing that you see within yourself that could use some change or could use some growth and just identifying that for yourself like what would be valuable to you um and yeah so it can be like little things like I want to just um I don't know get better at my my sculptures never stand up on their own. I want to be able to make a sculpture that can stand on its own. So I'm going to take a class in engineering or something <laughs> to, to figure this stuff out. Um, and I think anytime you're trying to learn something new, you always want to like use some of the budget to contract with mentors or like um, get take a class or purchase a book or something. Like it's nice to have that extra thing that's going to speak to the feasibility of like, I can do this because I took a class. That's my safety net in accomplishing the goal. Um, outlines and lists. So the beginning, at least for me, of all grants and grant writing is really just the list. So when we talk about the thoroughness, um, I will usually copy and paste all the questions, like every question on the grant. And I will make a bullet point under each, and I will make sure that I have at least one response for every single question. And it just, it can be like one sentence or like a word, but like one thing for each of those areas, because a good portion of grant writing is making sure you answer all the questions. <laughs> um, and so, and answer them directly, whatever the question is, what is it you want to do? You say you have one concise sentence. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to do blah, 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 whatever that, and not, oh, when I was a child, yeah, <laughs> ah, la, 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 and they go to this long thing, because what happens is reviewers typically <clears throat> in any panel of most anywhere, there's going to be this, this reviewer is going to have to read like 30 grants. Yeah. Okay. So 
they will begin to get very irritated if you're taking them down a very windy trail to what your objective is. So you want to go up on the top. I'm going to paint X amount of things, or I need to have X amount of things framed, or, you know, I need rehearsal time. And then you can go into the flowery description of, of what that means, you know, what, what it consists of and whatever else, but you want to put, put it up there and not make them go hunting because yeah. that whether you can just see it it's it's even if they're if it's not an overt thing it's just like ah you know people will be like I didn't understand this until I got to the budget or I didn't mm -hmm. you know so answer the question boom right out of the gate then you can be flowery if you want yeah I kind of think of like if there's a proportion or a formula that I I know of that make sense for it but you know like historically when I've written stuff it's usually like a third of like here's the the context like the big picture the background here's like why it's in interesting to me like the excitement piece and then a third of like this is what I'm gonna do and this is why that's important and then the last third is kind of everything in the middle which is just your details making sure all those details are sort of answered um I feel like balanced grants work a little bit better than ones that, again, lean more into the excitement or more into the, the thoroughness um, because they're able to kind of check all of these different criteria. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, nothing wrong with like, again, having people look over your stuff or like if you're an organization and you just like no people can write, like hire someone. <laughs> just there's no, there's no shame. <laughs> not everybody's a writer like writing in itself is a job so like if you like if it's just not anything that fits into your 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 mental framework that is fine um I think critique of society like thinking about you know how we're just kind of in schools and stuff kind of indoctrinated or not indoctrinated but like you know expected to like our intelligence is measured by like our ability to write and do all these things and sometimes you've got like great ideas and you just suck at talking about them so doesn't mean the ideas aren't good it just means that they need a little bit more uh, assistance in in existing um yeah, but yeah reach out to staff um I think too in in some spaces like I know it's happened at ARAC, but like sometimes like if you've talked to staff beforehand, we can advocate when people don't understand something in your application because we can remember like, hey, like we had this conversation and, you know, this is the genre, like I can vouch for the genre that this person is speaking to rather than um, when people apply and they haven't talked to staff. And then there's a part that, you know, we have no idea like what it means because it's written weird. Um, we can't really advocate for the the bad writing or even translate it because we weren't there we don't know you didn't talk to us about it so um historically yeah. I think that's been uh, a benefit to talking to staff too right and we can jump in because in in most review settings they ask you not to look at the artist outside of the grant okay so you can't assume let's say you are a well-known artist let's say you have a lot of stuff out there and then you write from the point assuming everyone knows who you are no you have to let the people know who you are because we ask you know please don't go and research everyone because yeah you could be causing biases without even thinking about it so and not everyone is there to be researched. So we're like, please try to stay within the boundaries of the grant and what they presented. So understand that, like you were saying earlier, if someone's a sculptor and a painter and this and that, you know, that's going to also feed other biases. So you want to focus on getting what you do into the body of the grant, say everything you need to say right there, supported by your resume, your artist statement, and your samples, and your budget. As a multidisciplinary artist, I have applied with my film hat, I have applied with my visual artist hat, my public artist hat, and they're all separate, like very separate. Even my resume, I have a different resume for each area that I do work in because it can get confusing when there's, you know, going through and they're like, oh, she's applied to do this film and all I see are murals she's painted or whatever like it's um making sure you're keeping kind of separate tracks um and I also keep like one big long resume with everything on it and I just make sure like if you're a musician make sure you're tracking like all the 
the places you've performed, venues you've been to, events you've been a, a featured artist for, um, for visual artists, like anywhere you put your art, like keep track of it. And like when you did that, because when we look at resumes too, it's kind of looking at the timeline um, to kind of make an assessment on, on again, feasibility of the work or, or quality of the work. Um, and then the last tip is kind of, I don't know, uh, uh, basically just making sure that you use language like I will rather than I hope. <laughs> yeah, the, the dreaded mid Midwestern reset that we all do. No one wants to call themselves an artist. You don't have to call yourself an artist. You can be a creative, you can be a whatever. You fall under the umbrella of artist. The Midwestern folk that we are just have a real hard time calling ourselves that. So um, and in person, I make everyone say it with me all together now. I am an artist. Because you have that conviction, you're starting to track your value and your worth and your everything, and it's just as much a job as any, anything else. Um, so don't be afraid to say that. And there's, so if you say, I so you just write it as though this is happening. It's like, I'm telling you that I am doing this. I am doing this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And you just say it, write it as though it's already done. Mm -hmm. And in my little woo-woo world, yes, I see someone ask, we'll have these posted. Um, we do have a workshop tab or a workshop heading under our resources tab. So... I know some, some, I just got an internet unstable thing. Um, but what was I saying? Oh yeah, the I will um, just do it. And then a lot of this too, and you have that and you're just saying, I'm organized. Here's what I'm doing. This is what I want to do. And this is how I'm going to do it. Boom. So really get all full of yourself and, and you just talk in the, this is happening mode. Yeah, you don't have to, I would advise against being like, I am the best painter in my entire oh, yeah. field. And, you know, there's a, there's a limit. Don't but go all on everyone. Yeah, it's definitely like, a, you know, there's a, a point of just like stating facts, like stay factual. Um, yeah. But you stay, I'm going to do this. Yeah, because it also like, I'm sure there's some psychological study out there where like people who, you know, st use the I will statements versus I hope probably are, um, prepping the reviewers to imagine it a little bit easier than a person who says, I hope. Like when someone says you, I will, uses the words, I will do something, like it automatically, I think, at least for me, creates an image in the head of like, oh yeah, okay, now I can start to visualize this. Whereas if you say like, I hope I will do this, then it's just kind of like, there's like a blockage that happens when you're a reviewer. Yeah. Well, you're, well, you're, well, and with, with that too, because we're always keeping in mind that Will this person complete the project they are laying out before? Uh, especially, you know, we are the stewards of public dollars here. So it's kind of, you know, if someone's like, well, if I can get this and if I can get this person, you know, the odds of that project happening, you're kind of like, oh, they don't sound so solid or sure about it. Whereas if, if you write it in the I will, I have engaged with these other artists, they are going to do this, you know, where you're just talking in the way of it's happening, whether I get your funding or not, really kind of puts that reviewer in that mode of like, this is happening mm -hmm. and we want to support that. So I think and one more thing on like the out outlines and lists, like when you have responses to every question, um, there's a way a lot of the time in panels, like we'll, we'll pull quotes from people's applications in order to back up information. And so when someone says, I have made, uh, or I have started communication, ongoing communication with five organizations for this project and I need to, or something like that, it's just, um, it helps kind of confirm the feasibility of things when you're able to, um, gosh, speak to the, speak to the, the bullet points, you know, that you've listed and speak to the criteria um yeah let's see and resume i won't go too in depth because we're already at 6 20 and we want to have time for questions oh but my goodness i know it went too fast hopefully for too everyone fast. else too but um uh yeah there's kind of a difference if you're applying for arts grants between employment and artist residence or resume i'm so used to saying residency um 
in the case of an artist resume, like that's any like volunteer work, anything you've done artistic, any classes you've taken, even if it's online, like stuff that has led to you being able to create what you do create versus employment. Like you can make the case that like, you know, working at McDonald's or whatever taught you like business management in some capacity, but, but you probably want to articulate that in some way in the, the grant if it's relevant. But if it's not, it's generally for arts grants, we're not looking for, you know, the narratives around your workplace. Um, there are exceptions. Again, thinking about like maybe someone who's never gotten to work in a place that's a professional field, but their quality of work is like amazing. And you can see in their resume that like, you know, they've been working at Pizza Hut their entire life. And if they could just like leave that space, they could become a famous artist based on their fault. Like there's just exceptional cases, I guess, where it's like, okay, I get it. I get why that's there. Right. It's not mandatory. You know, your artist statement, your artist resume, it doesn't have to be lengthy. We And we have different kind of tiers of our grants. So currently right now we have the artist access, which is a very starter grant, um, as well as the individual artists project, which is more advanced and, and our most competitive grant. So we always kind of try to have a balance of accessibility in our grants as well. However, you can have somebody who has nothing, has nothing, and but they're just amazing in the project that they're coming up with. So it's not all about your resume or your that just backs up where they say, oh, this person has done projects. This person has done XYZ. You know, they're not coming from the point of zero. Yeah, um, that adds to the, as it says here, the story story of your career, right? Like just, it's kind of like a timeline, you know, a timeline yeah. where you've been and where you're you're maybe potentially going or not. Um, one major pet peeve for all things is the human condition. So many artists and possibly some of you in this room, I don't know, but a lot of people use the human condition in their, uh, like the literal phrase, the human condition in their artist statements. I create artwork to evoke emotions and to explore the human condition. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> like when people are reading that, everything, you could make the argument that everything applies to the human condition and everything evokes emotion. And so like a better alternative to describing your work is to really like dive into like, what is the detail of the human condition that you're exploring? Like, are you looking at sadness through a lens of portraits of puppies or you know like you there's a, a a subject matter and a and a specific emotion if you're going the emotional route that you could use to build a better statement um I feel like 30 percent maybe half the grants I read in, in most spaces people reference the human condition and I just want to like pull my hair out a little bit um this is a big long thing. Let's see how many, okay. This is the last slide I think I'll, I'll do, but measurable outcomes. So for all grants, you're going to be asked uh, about measurable outcomes and um, kind of a common mistake people make is thinking like the outcome is going to be host an exhibit or complete the project. And um, basically the answer you should be giving to this uh, in all grants is not complete the project. It's not finish five paintings or play five, you know, performances. Um, the State Arts Board ha used to have, I'm not sure if they still do, but they used to have like examples that they would list of like other things you could measure. Again, keyword measure. So usually when we ask for a measure, a measurable thing, we will ask you like how you're gonna measure it. And a lot of people get awkward about it because it's just like, you know, artists who just create and follow the, the feelings of the human condition and things, but it's actually a helpful tool, I think. Um, speaking of feasibility and also like thinking about what what is it that you want to get out of the project that's sometimes a way to spin it instead of thinking like what do you think we want spin it like what what would be actually valuable for you to know moving forward in what you're doing so um, some examples are like basically measurable outcomes are like things that your project causes so that could include audience feelings or opinions and reviews uh, I could be specific demographics that you want to reach uh, and the percentages of those target demographics that turn up in your actual audience when you complete a project, um, new skills or abilities that you develop as a result of the project. So our example of a person who wants to paint shadows, like that's a that's a tangible skill that you can um, measure at the end. If you have like a, you know, a critic review your work and they say, wow, this is like prime 
shadow artwork. Wow. Shadow work is amazing. <laughs> amazing. So uh, like that would be a, a form of measurement is like getting feedback from uh, somebody. Um, the types of connections formed through the process. So like you have an art show and it leads to like that night you get to pitch your project to like two other galleries or something like those are again different types of outcomes that could happen keeping within your budget parameters like that's a, a real thing that people forget to measure like if you actually succeeded at spending at this level and maybe your goal or a goal you had was to be more like fiscally responsible um that could be a, a pair of measurements um any experiences you get to have as a result of the artwork being completed, any opportunities you gain during the grant timeline, um, and then the comprehension the audience might gain as a result of your work. Yeah, basically don't say I will finish the project. Use it to, you know, yeah, look at the big picture of what you want to do and, and what would be beneficial to you. We can't give tax advice, but make sure you're keeping track of your tax stuff. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, money leads to more money. It's kind of a lot easier after you get through your first grant to pursue other ones. Once you start getting those grants, like make sure you're putting those on your resume because, you know, sometimes panels really like to see that you know what you're doing when you get to your handed $50,000 and, you know, it worked, you did your project and now you're here and you're requesting $100,000. It's easier to give someone 100,000 after they just got 50 or, you know, easier to give someone 10,000 after they got a 1,000. It just kind of builds from there. Make sure your mission is aligning with the organizations you're applying to. So thinking back to when we talked about, like, sometimes corporations get tax write-offs and a lot of artists specifically, I know, have, like, turned down funding because it comes from, you know, big oil company or like a super racist corporation behind closed doors or whatever and so like making sure that you know kind of where the money's come with coming from and you're okay with it and i think that speaks a lot more towards organizations especially because sometimes your constituents will call you out for taking money from maybe corporations that are against what your your program or organization is trying to do and then didn't talk about it, but fiscal sponsorship is just another way you can have access to funds where you might not take as much of a tax burden. So fiscal sponsors are usually 501c3 nonprofits that can issue funding to you through the grants that you apply for. Um, some organization or some foundations require that you have a fiscal sponsor. So the organization that holds the money um, for you to retrieve it from or what have you. Resources. <laughs> <laughs> Could you, um, Amanda's requested you go back to the measurable um, outcomes screen real quick first. There you go. This one's a good one to screenshot. Yeah, grab a screenshot, but hopefully this records and we will post it recorded. She does, do you have the same one previously? So the those screens might be up too. What? Wait, what? What? What'd you say? On um, where we have our workshops posted. Yeah. Yeah. Did so we have this specific. Yeah. This one is there, um, probably with like different questions from people. And then we have one specifically where I go more in depth in the measurable outcomes. So more slides than this. I think I talk more about like what are the tools you can use to measure. Right. Um, the evaluations and outcomes. There's a workshop available on that as well. Well, then we'll continue to do them because we always get new questions. So maybe we we quickly will do a few questions. <laughs> I know we're at six thirty. We made it. We, go, we made it. <laughs> can we do it six thirty five? Can we do some questions? Yeah. All right. So anyone, if you want to take yourselves off mute and and ask a question, or pop it in the chat, or pop it in the chat. I'm very glad to see that so many folks showed up. So really the, the, the pieces, you need your resume, your statement, your budget, and then the narrative of your project with samples, work samples. In our grants particularly, we have embedded in there, it's like here is a tutorial on how to attach your samples. It's an issue to apply for more than one grant with the same project. 
Um, it is. That's where it comes to the breaking out of phases. Or um, the other part too is, is casting a wide net. And depending on the size of your project, you may cobble together with different, you know, this piece of it, maybe springboard from the arts supported, maybe this piece of it. Now, while we're associated with the Minnesota State um, Arts Board, so we can't double, we can't fund something um, that, you know, you can't like copy and paste your thing and send it to the cities and then get something there because it's gonna come out that it's the same project. So you're double dipping. So that's where phases are so good to that, where you say, I'm, I'm just going for this portion because I'm also applying over here for this portion or this, phase is further down and I intend on applying in the next round or you know things of yeah. that the I could give an example of like the the chief buffalo project because that was a lot of phases and a lot of different pieces and I'd fundraised around a hundred thousand dollars between like over a dozen different organizations and I think that project also had like state arts board funding and Arrowhead Regional Arts Car uh, Council funding but the way I kind of worked that was like, I created like this, you know, paying volunteers program for the the project. And so that was a project in and of itself that um, received, I think the state arts board funding. And then the ARAC was more like, I need supplies and like, I need my own personal like work to do for, for this um, paying for my time, like or organizing the actual design of the mural. And so if you break it up into like, uh, like for that project too, we had, you know, gosh, we had the supplies, we had volunteer time, we had lead artist time, I had like a little baby artist residency in it, I had like research and documentation and marketing and all these different pieces that were separate that could get their own kind of funding on their own from different pools of money. Um, and then thinking of, so I saw Salam said, when you were talking about the characters aloud, what were you saying? Basically, like when you apply for grants, there's a character or word count. So Minutes. So like a lot of times it's like 1500 character count. Now that means letters and spaces and, you know, so if you stick it in like a word document and put on the, the counter, you can choose a counter and it'll tell you how many. Even right. I know, I know that, but I'm saying like, were you saying to like use all the characters or to not use them? I, I would say don't make, like make your point. Don't yeah. feel like you have to fill the entire space. Yeah, because okay. thinking about like when people have like 30 grants to review, sometimes the short grants are really nice as long as they're answering all the questions. Like if you can answer all the questions and be a little excited um, in under 1,500 characters, that's amazing. <laughs> it's just that you, you, we do have some people that would write you a novel in, in every narrative. So that's pretty much the function of a limited amount is just to keep it and don't copy and paste your responses ever. That's another thing that surprisingly a lot of people do is like they answered the question up here and the next question is kind of similar. So they're like, oh, I'll just copy and paste my artist bio or my project description down here word for word. And nothing sets a panel list off more, I think, than you know, reading through 30 applications, spending like 20 hours get, trying to get, you know, content from these things and then running into like repeat statements. Cause then it's just like, it can get confusing and then they'll try and like reference. Yeah. It's, you can imagine why that's. Yeah. Cause I did do that sometimes because of it's, it's the same question. So like yeah. write it differently or like write the response, like. And they can be redundant. And we worked really hard to make our grants we took out a lot of questions to make them to the point. I think we have like four questions because they used to be repetitive. I mean, so it's like, I don't know. And some of them, um, some grant applications, and you'll see that you're asking me the same thing over and over again. So you can always kind of twist and crank. Um, another question here was how many applications does ARAC get in a year versus how many are funded? We're currently working on our annual report. Um, there's no one um answer to that because different grants kind of run differently what i will tell you is we have had a very marked increase in the amount of grants um when i started we would in any uh category we would receive like 12 to 18 grants 
um, the individual artist project, the, the most amount of grants we've had was 78 and we could only um, fund 12. So we're making some adjustments to try to get money spread out more. Um, we're also, we will be receiving a bit more grant funding this year. We're real excited about that. Um, so yeah, it depends. Um, we have other RACs who they, whoever applies, you know, they're in like the 90 percentile. We are really have um, incredibly talented people in all disciplines in our area. Um, I was well versed and then I came here and my mind was blown. It's amazing. So there's a lot of good competition out there. Um, if you don't get it, do not. It's, no one's picking on you. Do not take it personally. Um, just today, I had to give feedback for somebody. They scored a 93 and they still didn't get funded because there's just so many applications that were so good. Now we have other times, transfers, they'll tell you on the other side, because all of a sudden um, we had a time during COVID where no one could complete their stuff. So no one was starting anything new. So they were just frozen and we weren't getting uh, many at all. So it can go all kinds of ways. Don't, don't let those numbers scare you. You yeah. know, oh my God, we had 47,000 grants. Your yeah. chance is still good. And I think like Holly said, at least for ARAC, like we're trying to do things a little bit differently, spread out the money. And also I think this year we're making it so like you can't apply because part of why there were so many people, so many applications was because people were like putting the same project into multiple areas and just hoping they get one. And you could only get one for, you know, the project, but that still was like time that was being spent reading through all those things. And then if they had to decline it because they already got it in two buckets of money, then the outreach to people to figure out like, okay, who's next after, you know, we already yeah. had these people. Now it's one grant around, you can apply into one. So we have four categories open in our round, but you can only apply into one. You can only win one per um, year. But there are different rounds you can apply in for, you know, different kinds. But in a particular round, you can only get one per year. Um, James asks, can an out outcome benefit someone or some other organization other than the artists? For instance, I do a project that brings monetary or volunteers to an organization that highlights an issue the organization works with. Um, you can do that. You cannot donate um, or have a fundraiser or re- grant or refund this money somehow but if you if your art was highlighting like you said if it um you know paid stipends for volunteers or you know and we would be happy james if you want to reach out to me like what a lot of it is contingent on what is the organization you know what is the issue um so if you are ever writing those kinds of things, you really want to check with us first just to make sure you don't spend all that time and then have it bounced because it crosses a line. Definitely, I think that brings up the point. Definitely look at, we've restruct restructured our guidelines a little more like as questions. So it's like, who can apply? And it shows within that. Um, what projects can you do? What projects can't you do? So read through those first before you just dive in and start your thing because you could be wasting a lot of your time so we're going on an adventure to this page oh you're going on and there it is so yeah we for our grants again um speaking from what our missions are and and the restrictions that we have from our funder people um these are kind of our our lists of uh, that you can kind of find on the actual individual grant websites or um basically all of the pages that have the the grants listed that we have open. Um, but yeah, we've, now, we've also added another feature at the bottom that you can um, just print it out as a PDF. Yeah. So those are cool things to do. Yeah, and I think like if you're applying for 
it, it definitely is kind of case by case. Like if you're applying for an arts grant, then generally you do want to have an artistic goal or people are like the the purpose of the state arts funding is to fund artists and to fund like their creative goals. Um, this is kind of an example that we sometimes talk about in workshops of how, again, like some people get too excited about the topic that they're painting and they write like a whole essay on like why it's important to fight climate change. And then they don't answer like, like the grants aren't for fighting climate change. Therefore you expressing your voice, which may include the topic of climate change, but um, we can't necessarily like fund an issue. We have to fund your ability to speak to that issue. So it does have to be somewhat personal. Um, and yeah, you don't wanna do we can't fund fundraisers. So if you're like trying to call attention to domestic violence through your um, artwork and like the show is a fundraiser alone, uh, there's like, there's ways around it, right? So like it is an arts experience and you're doing a bunch of paintings or something for domestic violence. But like if the ultimate goal of the show is not um, for you to express that issue through your own voice and uh, as an artist and grow yourself, then it leans too far into the like, I'm just doing this fundraiser for domestic violence. And again, that's not an artistic goal, but right. in other places, like there's plenty of like, you know, social services are your vibe, like lots of funding in that area that is very interested in like looking at um, ways to incorporate art into the more like, like I have a show right now called Waiting for Beds. And um, it's got kind of like the goal of like looking at people in crisis care and um kind of like critiquing a, a a messy system right and so i've been able to get kind of arts grants for the artistic piece of it and the shows um but then there's like social service grants that i have access to because like i have panels or like there's activities that happen in the artistic space that aren't necessarily artistic in nature but yeah cross into storytelling and social service and all those things and just a, a tiny thing while we're on that um for organizations, you do not have to be an arts organization to apply for our um, arts. You can say it can be for an art activity within. So let's say you do want to have um, some sort of a open house or something, or you want to start, you have youth in your organization, or you want to do youth outreach and you want to do a big group art project to bring it in, or something like that you don't really have you know your main budget doesn't you you don't exist to be an arts community but maybe you have a small arts budget to do certain things with you can apply into us and again that's really good to have us lay some eyes it's always good to have us lay some eyes um and review things and give you some feedback and be like oh you don't want to go into that area you're getting too much here pull back from that here are the questions I have. Here are the questions I think the reviewers will ask. If you pose anything, you need to be able to answer it. So you don't want to speak in vagaries. You want to speak in certainties. Um, and uh, um, measurable outcomes. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're here to help and we're here to help you adapt. And if you do have a thing that leans more into that, you know, social issue or whatever, we can still help you adapt it to be more artistic. That's right. And also look to our resource uh, tab on our website too, because we have a lot of things. And like, for instance, there's other foundations that we have on there um, directed maybe more to like writers or more to visual arts or more to dance. Um, looking at those artist links, there's a lot in there. Um, another in our links also, there is the Minnesota State Arts Board. Currently, we do not have, we do not share any of our grants because our area is too intertwined. I don't like to show people's work from our area. So, but if you go to the Twin Cities, they have example grants that you can read a whole grant so you can get an idea of language and narrative. And there's different kinds and, and there's always something to glean from it. Um, in the future, I want to have some PDFs of like, this is a week 
proposal and this is a strong proposal. And just like in language, like to show comparisons so we can grow that. So stay tuned for that. Another adventure. Oh, another adventure. So, she went to the, the state website. Yep, state website. You can click literally any of the, the grants. And let's see, is this an example of one? So it's we'll go probably about three quarters of the way down or. So say you have a cultural community partnership. This is a grant that they used to have that, you know, benefits um, artists of color and working with organizations. And you can see kind of in the middle here, they have sample applications, which are actual applications people submitted that were funded. They aren't perfect. They are not all like 100% scores. There's problems with all of the grants that are on here that you're going to see. And they all got feedback, but ultimately they all had enough of the criteria um, outlined. Like this one specifically, they put in bold, like the project outcomes, the barriers, the actions. Um, some grants will do that for you, but the State Arts Board, I, historically, you kind of format it however you want to write it. They wrote their nice timeline out here, the community component, they've got their budget. So you can take a look at even like how they managed to like pay people or what they were charging for tickets. Um, that one was for dance. Uh, you'll see kind of in the beginning too, like this one is um, another performance one. So musical recordings. This one is spaces for emerging artists who are low income, queer and BIPOC to showcase their work. So this one's more like creating space and like cohorts and stuff like that. So sometimes you can like glean through the previous grants and get a sense of like not just like the language that's being used, but also like what are the rates that people are, you know, charging for their things or um, what are examples of outcomes that could apply to my specific project, so. Yeah, and I do like Pinterest. You can jump out on Pinterest and use it as a search engine for all things art and health and recipes. Um, but you can go on there and just kind of troll around and be like, hey, Grant, grant stuff. Go out on your Googler and you go grants um, or grant verbiage. And you can find all kinds of different formats and stuff too for inspiration. Because a lot of times, you know, that's what I've done. Oh, and like, ooh, this, this is a really good outline for what I want to do. Even though they're talking about, I don't know, social services or something else. But, but just in order, because there's really no reason to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, so oh. and that's why we have our little like if you look at the specifically the measurements workshop, I intentionally put like a it, the workshop itself is just one big cheat sheet of like here's the example for how to start a sentence. The audience will feel that 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 you fill in the blank. And so because there's only there's I mean there's always new ways to evaluate things, but the the ones that are tried and true have existed for a long time and we shouldn't be forcing people to invent new ways to measure things when you just want to make art. <laughs> right. And not everything has to be a survey. Like if it doesn't make sense for you to do a survey on your, you know, to survey participants in your program, don't do a survey. Like if you're not going to read the responses, find something else that makes sense. Like nothing wrong with a community conversation being used to evaluate rather than, you know, a digital survey and blah, blah, blah. Other questions? <laughs> Speaking fast. <laughs> I, think, I think we've worn everyone out for this particular round. Um, I am so glad to see so many, so many names, not so many faces. Amanda, it's sure nice to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm so glad that that you all had the interest and that you want to do this. There's a real, there's a PowerPoint. It doesn't have budget information though. Um, under our resources, and it's very basic, uh, you know, Grants 101, just kind of the pieces and the clunks. Um, this today we expanded more and talking more, you know, about as it, as if you have grant experience. So um, if anyone here doesn't have grant experience, do not feel bad. And if this was a little crazy, I'm happy to meet with you. Um, and uh, we have board orientation tomorrow. So our weeks, our last couple of weeks have been bananas. I'm behind on emails. I will be open to everyone next week when I can start breathing again. 
And Miri, she's got her. She just shared her ARAC um, email. Mine is, is the basic one. It's grants at ARA Council. Um, dot org. Uh, <clears throat> in the summertime, our response time can be a little different at times too, because we are traveling and trying to get out into community, trying to do in-person workshops. If you are from an outer area and you would like a workshop and to be in a room and gather people and we can hash things out, um, just reach out to us. We're also looking for networking because we find even before COVID, we were hearing people, a lot of art are artists work independently and become very isolated. So if you are looking for gathering, networking, hang out like-minded people, let us know that too. And we'd be happy to help organize.